draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sins. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done.
territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Right, that they wear sometimes. 
So when we see a cross, what does that remind us of? Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. So it reminds us of Jesus, and it reminds us that Jesus died on the cross, didn't he? The crucifixion. He got the point for the 50 cent work. So yeah, the crucifixion of Jesus. It always reminds us about Jesus, right? When we see a cross these days as Christians, but it also reminds us about how Jesus, how much he loves us, that he loved us so much that he died on the cross for you and for me and for, to take away our sin. So let's fold our hands and would you pray after me? Dear Jesus, help the cross always to remind me how much you love me and that I'm yours. Someday I'm going to 
figure out what that box is and see how much they're worth. I'm sure I got some Johnny Bench and Joe Rose and a few Rose and Joe Morgan and you know the original Big Red Machine. Uh, that was my team back in the day. Some people collect shot glasses. Some people collect those little silver spoons and hang them in their cases. My wife uh, has charm bracelets, and on them she has charms that are significant that are given to her by friends or charms that represent places where we've lived or worked. She even has a charm of the Pentagon, which you can only buy at the Pentagon. And uh, most women would not consider that a great gift from their husband, but she did. <laughs> Some people collect coins, some people collect military coins, and the military we have what we call challenge coins, each unit, or sometimes as a command chaplain, I have a command chaplain's coin that I can give out for superior performance for people that go above and beyond. I probably have a few hundred of those um, that cover my shelves in my office. Some people collect patches. When I was younger, when I was a little older, beyond the baseball cards, I actually collected hornet's nests, if you can believe that. It was like a little uh, nature museum when you went into my bed. <laughs> there were literally hornet's nests uh, hung from the ceiling. And I would ask people this time of year in the winter, when they're dormant or not around, if I could go and take that hornet's nest out of their tree or off their house, wherever it might be. More recently, I collect crosses, specifically clerical crosses, like the one I'm wearing today. This is probably my wife's favorite when it's polished up, it's silver, and it has a nice glisten and glint, and on the back side it actually has Christian symbols that are far too small for you to see from where you are. But there are other crosses that I have, not just the silver ones that I bought in the seminary. There's, there's this one's actually one of my favorite. It's got a, a bit of a Maltese cross, a Latin cross mix, and it's, it's got the Alpha and the Omega on it. It doesn't tarnish very easily, maybe that's why I like that one. I've got one that's actually literally made out of nails that have been welded together. Uh, this is my go-to cross for Lent. I have a cross here that uh, is one solid piece of walnut and the inside is cut out so it looks like a, a cruciform on there. Uh, this was made by a, a gentleman in my first parish over 20 years ago, Phil Lowe. Uh, he was a craftsman and, and that's a, a, a dear saint to the Lord who's gone to his heavenly kingdom. This one's actually made out of stone. It's made out of pipe stone. Which you can only get in Pipestone, Minnesota. So all the peace pipes and the pipes that Indian tribes, Native Americans had all across the country from here to the Pacific coast, the stone came from Pipestone, Minnesota. And the only people who are allowed to harvest it out of the ground these days are Native Americans. And um, they had a cross that was there when I bought it. This is another one of my favorites. I picked it up um, in Portugal. So it's, it's uh, actually handcrafted. It actually has the the craftsman's initials, uh, plated silver, and uh, just had that as a fond memory. This one was given to me by my father when he went and traveled to Palestine and Turkey. It's actually made from a, a pattern of an ancient cross that was worn for centuries and centuries and millennia, actually. But if you look closely on the one side, of it, there's a, a picture or it shows the image of Christ, but he's a different kind of Christ. It's, he's Christus Victor. He's, there's a crown. And his, he's not drooping, his arms are outstretched. He's wearing a robe, not a loin cloth. Uh, it is Christ victorious, worn by Christians for centuries. And then there's this one. It's made out of dirt, literally. It's, uh, I picked it up in Shannon, Ireland on my way to Iraq. I realized I had to draw a clerical cross with me. And so I put some uh, 550 parachute cord on it, that's what we call that. And I wore this all through my deployment in Iraq. It's literally made out of peat the bogs that are in Ireland, you know, they burn that stuff for fuel. They don't have a whole lot of, uh, they don't have a whole lot of trees and stuff in that northern part of the country. But when you press it down, it's, it's hard like rock. They're all favorites of mine. It's been said of the cross that, quote, no word in human language has become more universally known than this word, cross. Cruz, Santa Cruz and all those other Cruz places, it's all about the cross. And that because of all the history of the world since the death of Christ has been measured by the distance which separates us from it. The symbol and the principal context of the Christian religion and of Christian civilization is found in this one word, cross. You know, the cross, we see it and we automatically think of it as a Christian symbol. 
And we put it everywhere, don't we? I mean, you can check. I checked the hymnals, right? The green one, there's kind of a kind of a modern-looking representation. There's a cross on there. There's crosses on the hymn boards. And I dare say there's probably a cross or two in front of the church or on top of the church. There are crosses in these sconces over here, up and down the side. Uh, we have it everywhere. We, we put it on baptismal fonts. We put it on communion ware. We put it on candlesticks. Uh, we mark those things as special. We put them on our flags. We even wear a cross on necklaces and earrings. And that seems very common to us. Of course we do. But the cross wasn't always such a popular symbol. Far from it. In fact, for hundreds of years, it was used as an instrument of torture and death by the state. <clears throat> and sometimes it may be easy for us to get, forget that it wasn't just Jesus who was crucified on the cross. Or the two thieves that were next to him, right? The two bad guys. So we know of at least three that we talk about. But it had been used for over 300 years when Alexander the Great captured the Mediterranean world and, and subdued it. He used means of torture and intimidation. It's said that when he conquered Tyre, he executed 2,000 captains by hanging them on crosses until they died. You ever watch Spartacus? Great old Kirk Douglas movie. Uh, there's a lot of crosses in that movie, too. You see, Christian fiction wasn't just used by the Romans. It was used by the Greeks, it was used by the Babylonians, it was used by the Egyptians, it was used by the Persians, it was used by the Syrians. And it was a type of death that was very specifically reserved for really bad people. You didn't get it for robbery. But if you tried to assassinate somebody, or if you did assassinate someone, if you incited an insurrection, if you were accused of, of piracy, sedition, any of those really bad crimes, there's a chance you were going to have to pay for it and be made an example. And it was so terrible that Roman citizenship exempted you from being crucified. If you're a Roman citizen, membership has its privileges, okay? They can do all kinds of stuff to me, but at least they can't crucify me. Thank God, whoever your God was at the time. Crucifixion was considered the death of an enemy or the death of a slave. And while we look at the symbol and it's so commonplace to us these days, I wonder sometimes if Jesus had died in another point or era of history, what would we be observing instead of the Holy Cross? If he came during the French Revolution, would we have the Holy Deity? That was the common way of killing people then and making an example of it. If he came in the 1800s in the, in the western part of the United States, would we have the Holy Gallows and Hangman Zeus? Would there be the Holy Firing Squad in the 1900s? Or today, would there be a Holy Electric Chair or a Holy Lethal Injection Needle? If it came during the Holocaust, would there be a, a Holy Gas Chamber? And you may say, come on, that's, that's kind of over the top. That almost sounds irreverent. But that's just the point. It, it smacks us. It, it's hard to stomach. It doesn't seem right because it's hard to imagine Jesus in a guillotine or a gas chamber or an electric chair. And what would we hang up on the front of our churches? Would we have a, a, a gun? Or would we have an a, a, a injection needle? Would we have a guillotine? I mean, it's kind of hard. It makes me bristle to think about people wearing little mini electric chairs and earrings. Or, <laughs> it's hard to fathom. Right? But that was the means of executing people by the state in the day, and it was the worst of the means to execute someone. It seems almost too shocking, too defiant, too much to even comprehend. But that's the point. That's what faced the people of Paul's day. That's what faced the early Christians. That Jesus died on a cross. It was shocking. It was nonsense. It was offensive to them. That they could be saved by a man who died a shameful criminal's death, just like all other really bad criminals until the 4th century. For about 600 years, that's how it happened. And it's even more nonsense to postulate that God himself would allow himself to suffer in that way. And that's why Paul writes in the verses just after our text, verses 21, excuse me, 21 through 25. 
He says, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God to do the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles, to the Greeks. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Unlike some of the other disciples that were called in our gospel text today, Paul was a wise and learned man. He had studied the feet of Gamaliel. He was advanced in his years. But he knew that all the earthly wisdom that he and others possessed could not compare to the wisdom of God. And man's wisdom doesn't cause man to know God. Instead, God is known by the way he chooses to reveal himself. And God chose to reveal what kind of God he is, of all things, through the cross. To those who consider themselves wise, it just doesn't make sense. Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's pure foolishness for people back then just to say the Messiah is some guy that died in an electric chair last year. It was the cross. We lose that in our society. And as shocking as the image was for those people in those days, it still is and should be shocking for us today. We say those words so easily, but it's the word that God loves the world so much, the sinful world, that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's the message that Christ Jesus, as Paul writes to the Philippians, who being in the very form of God, did not consider it robbery to be an equal with God, but made himself equal of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, and here's the other shoe drop, even death on the cross. The cross, I'll tell you, is a stumbling block for Muslims. I have a good friend who's a Muslim. He's an Air Force chaplain. But for a Muslim, they are not willing to accept that such a great prophet, even not the Son of God, but the prophet, Jesus, died on a cross. Instead, many of them teach and believe that it wasn't Jesus who died on the cross. It was Judas, or it was Simon of Cyrene, because they were all beaten up so badly nobody really recognized them anyway. But to say that Jesus is true God which is hard for them to comprehend and accept. And then to say that God died on the cross is incomprehensible to them. Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's the power of God because on the cross is where God chose to show us his love. It was on the cross where he made himself weak so that we could receive forgiveness of God. And it was there that he made a payment for the sins of the whole world, and Paul even uses a different term, the propitiation for our sins. It's not just payback. It's not just, okay, I borrowed 20 from you, here's your $20 back. No, it's payment and restitution because I've offended you. I've held that 20 for you for a long time. It should be worth about 60 by now. He's the propitiation, the payment for our sins, and not just ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And that's power. That is power that not only changes us for eternal life, but it changes us for our daily life. Here again the words of St. Paul. When he talks about fighting off sin and trying to live a holy and sanctified life, he says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It doesn't control me anymore. I put it to death. We talk about our baptism, especially as Lutherans. Luther like to talk about renewing your death every time, excuse me, renewing your baptism daily and dying to sin and rising to live a life of righteousness in Christ. It's all made possible by the cross. And that's why the church will continue to erect and inscribe and emboss and make the sign of the cross. Think about it. When you were baptized, whether you were an infant or an adult, I guarantee you, 
The sign of the cross was made on your forehead and upon your heart to mark you, I always call it God's invisible brand, and mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. They've been branded by the cross. When you entered this house this morning, and we began the name of the triune God, the sign of the cross was made over you. When the benediction is spoken at the end of the service, the sign of the cross will be made over you. It will be made multiple times during the service. In a few weeks from now, when Lent begins with Ash Wednesday, many of us will receive a, a sign of the cross marking us, reminding us of our mortality, that we're come from dust and ashes, and dust to ashes we shall return. But that's not the end of the story, because the cross has changed all that. And when you die and receive a Christian burial, the cross will be made over your body to mark it as one that is waiting for the resurrection morn and when Jesus comes again. You know, for those in Paul's day, the cross was an ugly instrument of death. It was not a piece of glory. And I think sometimes we should remember it that way. I think sometimes we need to remember what it really is all about. And as I told the children, to be a reminder of how much God loves us. It's kind of like a 9-11 memorial service. When we see it and really think about it, we'd rather not bear the sight and live through it again, but we dare not forget it. And as Christians, we also know that it's okay to make crosses out of nice polished wood and silver and stone. It's nice to have those to remind us, no matter what they're made of. Because when Christians first started making crosses in about the 3rd century, to wear and to carry. They were empty crosses. Or they were like this one that had a Christmas victor, Christ victorious, on the cross with a crown on his head, not a crucified one, but one who reigns from the cross. And that's a good thing, because the cross was either empty or he was reigning victoriously, and what was once a terrible instrument of torture now reminded them and us that it has become a beautiful sight of salvation. And I pray that whenever you see this symbol, that it reminds you that for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In His name and for His sake, Amen. Rise. We have the privilege of joining together in confessing our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand.
who has gone. And we ask that God would give them the peace and his eternal comfort. Also those we name in our hearts. That the Lord Jesus would heal them in body and mind and soul. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. We pray for penitent and joyful hearts. That those who partake of the sacrament this day would rejoice that the kingdom of heaven is at hand in the body and the blood of Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. And we pray for bold witness before the world. That God would open our mouths to speak of the wonders of life and salvation that his Son has worked for us. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and the death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb of his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.